it is my pleasure for week two to introduce you um, to Dr. Kosiva. She's the forest ecologist at, as part of the um, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation here in Vermont. And she specializes in understanding tree response to climate and other environmental changes. And she also is a tree physiologist. So I'm sure you guys will learn a lot. Um, and welcome to Dr. Kosiba. Thank you very much for having me uh, remotely. <laughs> it's nice to see some of your faces. Um, yeah, so I um, recently um, became a, a member of the state government of Forest Parks and Recreation as the, the brand new climate forester. Um, and I'm gonna talk about Vermont's forests and climate change kind of there's a lot to cover, so uh, it's a little bit general, but I'm happy to at the end take questions um, and uh, and hopefully it will spark some interest and some some new uh, learning for you all. So a little bit about me, um, as Emily mentioned, my background is tree physiologist. That really means I understand tree processes, and those processes are integral to how a tree lives and acts in a forest, but also those interconnections in a forest that provide habitat, provide um, clean water, air, all these things that are really uh, integral um, to really uh, a forest. And um, as a state climate forester, I need to start really helping us as a state think about how do we protect our forests um, in climate change and what roles do they have in in mitigating climate change and I'll talk about both those things in my talk. Um, I came from most recently from the University of Vermont where I was a researcher. Prior to that I, I uh, taught classes in the Rubenstein School um, and then was a grad student. So I've had a lot of different varied hats here but I've been in Vermont for about 10 years um, working in the, in the forest and, and um, love Love being here, love our forest. We're incredibly lucky um, to live where we are. So I'm also happy to answer questions about uh, my path at the end or other, other things you'd like to know about how I got to where I am. Um, so I, if there's one thing that you all can take away from my talk, I hope, is that trees are amazing. Um, you, know, if, you know, if you wanna go out after this, I'd love if you go hug a tree, thank a tree um, for their amazing properties that they provide us. And, and I think we take for granted trees and forests. Um, as you'll see, this will run through all these great things that they provide. I mean, aesthetic beauty. We love looking at trees and forests. Um, fall foliage is coming up, maple syrup, wood products. We all, houses are built with wood. We have tables and wood paper. Um, you can think of all these things, but also some of these other things we don't see as much. So storing and sequestering carbon, and I'll talk about that, um, but nutrient cycle, cycling, water cycling. Um, there's a lot of really important functions that trees um, provide that we often take for granted and, and don't quite appreciate. And I, yeah, I'm here to hopefully make you all appreciate trees and forests and that we need to really do a, a lot to steward them into the future under um, changing climate. So in Vermont, like I said, we're lucky. We have a lot of forests and for the most part, people are really appreciate their beauty, walking in them, hiking in them. Um, we have about 4.5 million acres of forest, which is uh, about 76% of the state. And that holds 3.4 billion trees, which if you look at the population of Vermont, that's about 5,000 trees per person. So that's a pretty good ratio um, when you think about it, uh, how, many, how many trees we have here in Vermont. Um, but there are a lot of local and global reasons, um, as I've insinuated, that really need to increase our attention to forests and how much we value and appreciate them. Because um, really we are uh, here <laughs> in many ways because of the things that trees and, and forests provide. So the first part of that is actually forests can help us mitigate climate change. And what that means is they actually can help reduce the impacts of climate change. And they do that just by natural processes. Trees are amazing. As I've said, they photosynthesize along with other plants, um, which means they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere 
with sunlight and water convert those into sugars. And so we call this carbon sequestration. You might have heard this term. Um, it's a verb, so it's the act and the process of taking in that carbon uh, and converting it to a more stable form. Um, so usually that means that carbon dioxide is converted into sugars, that's the tree's energy, and put into wood, bark, leaves, anything like that. Um, and I'll, I will say that um, as we, we recognize the value of forests in the carbon cycle, it's also used to talk about fluxes in the forest, and I'll explain what that means in the next slide. And then carbon storage is just really the amount that is in the forest, in a tree, um, and we have these divided into different carbon pools. And I have an illustration on the next slide, but trees, soil, leaf litter are the carbon pools. So the process of taking it out, carbon sequestration, and then it's stored in things like wood. <clears throat> so it's a little bit of a complex, uh, well, there's just a lot going on. Uh, the carbon cycle in a forest, and this is showing the pools, as I've mentioned. So if you just focus here, above, live, above ground live biomass, that's just a tree. The, top of a tree. You combine that with the roots, you get the live biomass pool. And this little green arrow is just that carbon sequestration I was talking about. So trees are pulling in that carbon dioxide, converting it into growth, into new roots, new leaves, new wood. They also release some because every living thing, organism metabolizes and needs to use some of the energy and they release that carbon dioxide back in. So that's a little blue arrow, but the green arrow is bigger. Um, and whoops, and so they sequester more than they release. And then as parts of this tree die, as leaves are shed in the fall, as roots die, whole trees, they flux, so they transfer that carbon into these other pools. So the litter pool, the dead wood, standing dead trees, logs on the ground, um, and then also to the soil pool. So this is really a long-term uh, storage site for carbon. Oh, carbon is turned over by microorganisms, fungi, bacteria in there, but a lot of it gets stored um, for quite a long time in this deep, deep soil. So it depends on the type of forest you have, but some forests can store soil, for, store carbon for thousands, thousands of years. And then we also, when we have a managed forest, we can have carbon go into these flux, into these other pools. So if we harvest wood products and make a table or hardwood floors, um, that carbon is essentially locked into that product for the life of that product. So there's really value in using our wood wisely. So we have, when we have wood, putting it into long-term products, high value and high quality products. Those wood products then transfer the landfill and then they will start decomposing and releasing that carbon dioxide. So it's constantly cycling, carbon dioxide then is taken back into the forest. What's really cool about our forest here in Vermont because we have so much is it offsets a lot of our greenhouse gases that we emit as a state. So this blue bar here is our, this is for 2018 is the most recent data I could get is our state carbon emissions. So you can see it's about nine, and this unit is million metric tons of carbon dioxide. And this little E means equivalent because some of our greenhouse gases are released as methane, some as carbon dioxide. We convert them all into the same unit to make it comparable. So that's carbon dioxide equivalent. That's how much we release as a state, or at least did in 2018. And this is how much is taken up by our forest. So sequestered by forest, it's a little less than five. Um, and this is the net of those two amounts. So you can see we still have net emissions, but it's much less, 50% less, because forests are taking in a lot of the atmospheric carbon dioxide. So it's incredibly important. Again, this is like a really important value that forests have. They were only just now appreciating in a more uh, <laughs> widespread sense. Um, and then this is showing, here we have the, like the average amount of carbon storage in an acre. And why I'm showing you this, not to get, don't get bogged down with the numbers here, but really the proportions. So carbon storage, remember that's the amount that's in the forest. And if you look at the brown here is soil. That's more than half of the carbon in a forest in an acre is in the, in the soil. And the above ground biomass, below ground biomass, so live trees, you can see is about 36%. 
So it's a really important uh, component too, but that soil, incredibly important for our carbon storage. When we look at the rate of uptake, so the carbon sequestration, you can see now the green plus the blue below ground and above ground, live trees are sequestering about 80% of that carbon coming in. And what I wanna draw attention to is this little brown sliver. So that means that soils really sequester carbon at such a slow rate compared to how much is in there because they need trees to die, litter to fall on the ground, decompose, microbes to do their thing before it gets into the, into the soil. So that's, that can take time. It takes natural processes and the forest takes tree death um, and new cohorts coming in. Um, so it's really imperative that we protect that soil carbon because it takes a long time to get it back to its original level. So the best way to maintain our carbon um, in the state for forests is keep forests as forests. And um, there's a couple ways that we have incentivized to do this. And I wanted to talk about this because carbon is a new part of this, is how we can actually incentivize keeping forests as forests. So one of the strategies is we've developed in the state is we've reduced taxes on forest land. And I, sh I just grabbed this little screen grab from like a realty site just recently. And the cost of forest land is a lot because people will put a house on it, which is fine, great, I live in the forest. Um, but it means that forest land can often be sold more for development than it brings in for other resources um, like timber or maple syrup or things like that, or just keeping forests as forests. So um, what we've developed in the state is uh, quite a while ago in the early 90s is a use value appraisal. Basically, it lowers your taxes if you have active management. And it keeps that way um, for 10 years so that if you do revert and you trans and you clear that forest for development, you actually have to pay a penalty. So it helps keep that forest as a forest um, for at least 10 years. Um, the, other op the other thing is keeping an income stream, right? Maple syrup, these other crop products, really good timber we have in the state. We have amazing trees, sugar maple, yellow birch that produce wonderful, really great wood products. Um, we should be very proud of. And then the new um, stream of income from forests is what are called carbon markets. I'm not going to get into all the details because it's confusing, but just to plant a seed so you know that this exists, basically you're trading the sequestration on your forest, the amount, say, your, the amount your forest sequesters in a year, you're trading that to an industry um, for their emitting their uh, carbon dioxide. So it's a greenhouse gas exchange program. And really it's supposed to incentivize those big industries Amazons of the world, JetBlue, you know, those big industries that really do release a lot of greenhouse gases, but sometimes there's some inevitable um, releases they have to do. They can offset that amount by buying credits from a forest, from that sequestration that happens. It's very simplified. It's much more complex like that than that. And it's, you know, part of our, uh, but it's a, a really interesting, I think an important um, thing that's gonna be uh, in, uh, in the future too. And then always we can conserve forest land, right? So it prohibits, if we conserve forest land, it prohibits it transitioning to other types of land use, right? Like so a development or something like that. Um, and really carbon markets help with that because when you enroll a parcel of land in a carbon market, you are actually signing a contract sometimes for 40 or 100 years to keep that carbon there. And you will pay a penalty if you do revert and you release that carbon. And then also the use value appraisal program, as I mentioned, it's a shorter contract, but it really does help keep forests as forests. And it's a big reason that we still have 76% forest cover in our state. Um, and then also, as I'll talk about in the next bunch of slides about climate change, it's really imperative in that, that we keep our forests healthy and productive. If they're not, if we see really big declines in tree health, forest health, we could even have death or mortality of trees. Um, that is not gonna help keeping forests as forests and keeping all these other um, components for a forest landowner. 
So while forests can help mitigate climate change, um, they're also really threatened by climate change. So one side, they could help lower the impacts, and the other side, those impacts are really damaging to them. And so some of the impacts that um, climate change can have, one of them, we have increased temperature, right? Increased annual temperature. This is really, we're seeing one of the um, big changes, we're seeing a longer growing season. So this figure here, this um, map shows changes in the growing season. And where we are here in Vermont, you can see we're almost up to an increase of 20 days. And this is over a long time period. So it's not something you really notice from year to year, but if you do things like maybe you garden or you like um, looking at flowers, they even, I noticed that this year we had a really warm summer and things flowered a lot earlier um, than they normally do. So you might, you might be able to pick up on it, but it's really those long-term trends that we're looking at. Um, any one year can kind of buck the trend, um, but we're seeing this really uniformly um, across the United States. I will say, I find this really interesting. You might have, your eye might have been attracted to this part of the map um, where they're actually seeing the opposite trend. And this is, I'm not a climatologist, but there's some really interesting work going into this. This is called a, like this cooling hole in the southern United States. And it's thought to be because of El Nino, La Nina events um, and, and ocean currents that, again, I'm not an expert in, but it's really interesting. And the thought is that that is not going to persist, that, that at some point, there will be a point when that accelerates um, with, as the rest of the country um, is showing. So we could see um, with this, it could be a positive benefit, right? Like longer growing season, more tree growth, that's great. But what that can do, especially when we see this be rapid, is it can change these dynamics that we have in a forest. It might favor certain species. It might make these phenological mismatches, we call them, which is basically when something in the forest happens, when two things used to be really well timed, and now because of changes, one thing is happening at a different time than the other thing. So for example, you could see um, that, uh, you know, animals and birds can react to climate changes more easily than a tree um, because they can't move. And so you could have instances where birds react and come into Vermont before um, food is available or vice versa. So there could be a lot of differences that happen, especially in the short term as things are tumultuous and are, are occurring at a, at a really fast pace. The other thing about changing growing season is it really benefits a lot of insects and diseases, especially the ones that are not from here and we consider invasive. So those usually um, can capitalize on that um, longer growing season. This is a really good, you'll, if you, um, if anybody knows what honeysuckle looks like, the invasive honeysuckle, Asiatic honeysuckle, you'll see it in the forest in the, in the spring and it can leaf out before any other native trees or shrubs leaf out. And if you look, in you know, kind of April before our trees have leafed out, in some places in our forest, um, it's all honeysuckle underneath. So you, you can really benefit those those species a lot, um, and and certainly those pests, uh, insects, and diseases. Some insects are even having multiple generations in one year when they used to only be able to have one. So the longer growing season can actually make it so, like for you know, a caterpillar um, can actually have two generations. Went the wrong way. Another um, impact, and this is one we've really been seeing already. Um, I think uh, precipitation is going to be a, a big issue moving forward in our state because we have, you know, fairly steep terrain, but we've seen more heavy rainfall. Um, and this map shows the United States, and you can see here in the Northeast, we're seeing a 71 percent increase in the amount of heavy, heavy precipitation, which is huge. That's a lot of heavy precipitation. That often means we have things what's called overland flow, which actually this photo is, a, this, this photo is capturing, this is my, where I live in Bolton and my property, um, and we had a really heavy rainstorm. And you can see, this is actually a natural little stream, but up here the water is going around and over the forest floor. Um, and it doesn't absorb. It actually doesn't get back into the uh, deep uh, reservoirs of water, the aquifers, um, and that can be available to plants. It just flows off. Um, it also can cause 
quite a lot of erosion. You know, soils and nutrients can get washed down into our rivers, our water bodies. You know, Lake Champlain has a lot of problems with what's called nutrification and, and a lot of nutrients um, getting input into it. So it can cause a lot of, a lot of issues um, that way. Um, and also is not, is really can be detrimental to trees because it can wash off the litter layer and expose roots. So roots actually aren't as deep as you think they are. Some of them are, but some are very surface, uh, at the surface, um, are very shallow. And so that litter layer keeps them moist, protects them from the sun, from, you know, people and animals walking on them. And so when we remove that, that leaf litter, um, that can be really problematic, especially for a tree like, like sugar maple. So overland flow and heavy precipitation events are, are going to be a big, a big deal. And if you think about roads that we have in the state, um, dirt roads, we have a lot of steep roads. This can also be hiking trails, can also, can also cause a lot of infrastructure issues. Um, we're projected to have more ice storms um, in the future. And really, that's because uh, that's uh, really at the cusp as our, as our climate warms, we can have these events that still are cold enough to cause ice, but, but, um, but the ice then sticks to the trees and coats them, as you can see in this photo. And it can coat quite thickly on the branches. And there's a point where a tree just cannot sustain that. Branches might break, a whole tree might break. Um, and it actually can weaken, even trees that survive can get weakened. They can have issues in their, uh, their, their wood because of it. So it can actually affect timber value. Um, it can make it much more easy for those trees to topple later in a windstorm or some other event. Um, and obviously this creates huge infrastructure issues, right? So power lines, roads, hiking trails, buildings, all sorts of stuff. Um, that, that could be really problematic um, in a number of ways. Um, and then we're also, as, as winter's warm, so we're really seeing when the, the warmest, uh, or the temperatures are, are warming the most in the winter here um, in Vermont. So that means we're, we may still be getting cold temperatures, but overall we're getting, we're projected to get less snow. Um, and this is really uh, in the lower parts of Vermont. You know, if you go up to our mountains, Mount Mansfield, um, that's probably, that's not going to be the case for a couple more decades, but we're already seeing it in some of the lower areas because they're right on the cusp as you transition from 32 degrees Fahrenheit above that rain, turn, uh, snow turns to rain. Um, where you go higher elevations, you're still, still getting those cold temperatures that can promote snow. Um, so, there's been some experiments I've been part of actually over in New Hampshire where they, we studied what the effects of snow removal are um, and it can cause, it can kill roots. Again, those roots are not that deep down in the soil um, and it can cause more soil freezing. So that's, the snow is incredibly important for, um, it's like an insulative blanket. You can think of it that way on the on the soil. And so our soils actually, when we have lots of snow, they don't freeze really super deeply. But if you remove that um, soil and you still get some cold temperatures, it can actually freeze or they can freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. And so you can get really big issues that affect trees, affect tree roots. Also, you can imagine that affects roads. When we get freeze-thaw cycles, it can break up asphalt, can cause pipe, you know, water pipe problems. So there's a lot of other issues um, from that, not just in the soil. Um, and it also can mean if we don't have a deep snowpack that then melts in the spring, it can actually mean we can have dry springs um, if that snowpack doesn't, you know, we, our forests are really adapted to get this input of, so, of moisture in the spring. And again, it can lead to this phenological mismatches. So really that's like things like the soil microbes might um, be pro uh, come alive before the tree does, or not come alive, but come out of dormancy from the winter. Um, you can have a lot of differences that happen if, you know, sugar maple gets really hurt by um, deeper soil freezing and low snowpack, but red oak growing next to it does it. You can have competitive advantage differences. So it can just really like throw things off um, and, make, and make a lot of changes in the forest. Um, as I mentioned, we have warmer winters. Um, and this is, you know, if you're a gardener, this is actually kind of cool in Vermont because 
our plant hardiness zones have, have changed. So our minimum winter temperatures are not as low as they used to be. And so that means like, you know, you might be able to plant peaches and, and things like that, which seems great. Um, but for trees that have been adapted to our climate, it can be really problematic. They can actually come out of dormancy. So trees go into dormancy in the winter, kind of shut down. If we get really warm temperatures, they can come out thinking it's spring. Then if we get cold again, it can harm them. So there's a lot of issues that can occur then. Um, and it really, again, again, it benefits these invasive pests and pathogens and, and plants that we have here. Um, an example of that is this hemlock woolly adelgid, affects eastern hemlock trees. It's this little insect that feeds on the, on the, on the leaves and needles. Um, and it is really, right now in Vermont, we don't have a lot of hemlock woolly adelgid because we get really cold winters. Last winter, not very cold if you were here in Vermont and hemlock woolly adelgid that we do have in southern Vermont. We have some in Bennington County. It survived really well and in previous years like 99.9% .9 of the population has died. So we've had cold temperatures. So this is really worrisome. If we continue to have these warmer temperatures, hemlock woolly adelgid will certainly become more prevalent and it kills hemlock. It, it completely kills hemlock. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's some benefits to some of these changes that we might see, but really these happening all at once um, and in such a rapid time frame is really problematic to trees and forests. So this is showing that, this illustrates how quickly, so I can play this a couple times, but the, uh, the blue is carbon dioxide concentrations. You're looking many, many millions of years in the past and the red is temperature, and this is present day. So you can see that this rate is happening so quickly compared to what we've, what we know happened in the past. And that's really what's concerning. It's not that our climate, our climate's always changed. It's always gone through these different cycles, but the rate of change um, is, is, is really concerning. And trees in particular are really vulnerable. They can't pick up and move. They're not a bird, they're not a moose. They really, they're stuck where they are. And the only way that they can get, you know, move is to uh, reproduce. So producing a seed and a seedling, but that can only travel so far. Um, and so, and there is genetic adaptation that happens over populations, but trees are very long lived. They might not produce a seed until they're 40 years old. Um, so that the rate of change can be fairly slow um, in, in a tree. Um, whoops. So what this is showing is more than half of Vermont's tree species are projected to see a decline in suitable habitat. So this is um, from the U.S. Forest Service. They model what trees do we think are going to have issues in a changing climate. And it's really based on not population, but whether the habitat will be suitable for those trees, that tree, tree species to live in. So um, if, if it needs certain cold temperatures, if it needs certain conditions, are they going to be there um, in another 20, 30, 50 years? Um, and these are all modeled. We don't really know what's going to happen, but they're based on our best projections of, of how those trees are growing in current conditions. And what you'll see here is that um, this is change in habitat suitability. So a lower, a negative number means a bigger change and is not as favorable for that species. And what you can see here is that most of these species that are projected to have a, net, a change in habitat suitability so that it will not be as suitable here in Vermont are some of our most important and numerous species we have in the forest. So you all should know sugar maple, um, I hope, and that has that's projected to have the biggest change, right? But also Balsam fir is incredibly important on our mountains. It's really the species that goes up to tree line, supports a lot of really important wildlife. You know, American beech, red maple, paper birch, these are all some of the most important um, economic, but also ecologically important um, species that we have here. And you'll see that the species that are projected to increase are some that we don't have as much here. They're a little bit more of Southern species. So the oaks, um, and the hickories are projected to do well. And those are species that exist more southern Vermont and then well into 
uh, Massachusetts and South. So the idea being that as we have a warmer climate, those Southern species will do better, will find Vermont more favorable than these traditional, more Northern species. All right, so the impacts of climate change on trees are quite varied and, and um, but really the, the idea here is that you could have tree could become stressed, right? So if it's, um, if the, it comes out of dormancy early and uses some of its energy in that process, or if, um, if some of its roots die because of overland flow, you can have tree stress. Um, so those can be, may, maybe means it doesn't produce as much seed or doesn't produce as much seed uh, over like the longer time period between um, seed years, which means there's not as much reproduction, which means that's going to affect our future forest, right? It might mean that that tree needs more water and nutrients, um, so it's going to take those from other trees, so it can change that competitive balance. So these are going to be like things in the um, short term, we might see a decline in a maple syrup year or, uh, you know, really poor fall foliage. And trees can respond to stress. They can, you know, it happens any year. Um, this year in particular, this growing season was really, really dry and hot. Trees will be fine as long as that's not what we experience next year. They can really deal with these seasonal changes as long as they're transient and not long lived. But this can lead to poor health over time. So this might even mean we see changes in species dynamics. If our sugar maple um, gets stressed out and aren't doing as well, maybe the red oaks take over and we suddenly have a lot more red oak in our forest. Um, and that can really reduce or eliminate e ecosystem services it provides. So maple syrup, right? We, maybe we can't produce as much maple syrup in Vermont and that's incredibly important to our economy and our identity and it's tasty and I love it. So that'd be really sad, right? So there, there can be a lot of these changes or there might be more um, erosion because uh, if a, a riparian tree like green ash dies, it has this really important function to protect uh, stream buffers. And we can actually have lower growth, which means actually those forests would not store as much carbon and they actually might start releasing it if they're really stressed or if they die. We could see things like um, forest die-offs of certain species. I really, I'm optimistic that we're not going to see these things because I think there's some really concrete things we can do um, to help forests. Um, but you know, this is like preparing ourselves for this is, we need to step in, be proactive and do something because um, forests, you know, need, need some, some help here. Um, it could be less wood production, which really affects, we have a big wood economy here. Lots of people heat with wood, including myself. Um, and so if we have less wood production, it could really have these other economic costs. So as I've mentioned, I really do think we can do quite a bit to help forests adapt to climate change and be good stewards. Uh, fundamental to that is just recognizing the importance of forests and their value um, and that they are vulnerable and that we need to do and take steps um, to help them. And so this is, I'll walk through these, but these are kind of really general um, things we can be thinking about as a state to um, help forests. As I've already said, <laughs> number one, uh, keeping forests is forests. Um, this is uh, showing how we're losing forest land over time. So you might not um, be aware, but in the early 1900s, we had almost complete clearing of Vermont forests for agriculture, um, a lot of sheep farming. Um, and if you look at old historic photos, it's pretty incredible. Um, the Green Mountains were pasture, you know, it was, it was uh, pretty well cleared. But we've been seeing this regrowth of forests um, over time since then and hit a peak around the 19, mid 1990s. And now we're seeing a decline. Um, and so this dark green line is the estimated forest cover. And I say estimated because it's really hard to do this. They actually have to do it with satellite imagery. Um, and you can see this, this green back here is the variability. So it's, we don't have a great, we, we don't have the exact number of forest loss, but we can estimate it pretty well. And these show that at least since 2005, um, we've lost forest acreage. And this is one estimate. There are, there are a few and they all show forest loss. And this is from the US Forest Service showing about 4,000 acres lost a year. And if you remember the 
carbon storage, each acre of forests in Vermont store about three to 400 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is huge. So you remove that, you remove the storage, and you remove the subsequent sequestration. So those, those forests not only don't store that amount, but they're not taking in um, any more carbon either, carbon dioxide. Um, and so next to this is thinking about our forests and the composition. So really making sure there is sufficient regeneration. So seedlings and saplings of different species and age classes. Um, and this is really a problem in our forests for a couple reasons. Um, but really it's, as I talked, as I just mentioned, we had this widespread clearing um, and regrowth, which means our forests are kind of at the same age or about 80 to 100 20 years old for the most part. Um, and so we need to make sure we have a future forest. And part of the way that forests do this is they have natural disturbance cycles. So maybe a tree dies or a few trees die just naturally or maybe in a windstorm or something like that uh, um, comes along. And that leaves a little pocket for the new cohort of trees to have light and grow. And so we can do some management practices I'll talk about um, to get us there, but really we need to make sure there is a fish, sufficient regeneration so that we have a forest in 50 years. Um, we also uh, need to pres preserve refugia. So refugia, basically I'm um, thinking about places that maybe have special um, species that exist or communities. Maybe they have really high biodiversity. Maybe they're really old. We don't have a lot of old forests in our state. About 1% of our forests are over 150 years old and that's probably a high estimate. I bet it's lower than that. So preserving those old forests, keeping that diversity of, of types of forests on our landscape, that's really important. Um, we need to control water. So flow of water um, on our forest, letting the water stop, spread out, and sink into the soil is incredibly important for many, not only soil and the forest, but you know, our water quality and our roads, our infrastructure. And one way we can do that is this photo looks incredibly messy. It's forest management um, that has left all the, what we call slash, but all the branches and looks like, you know, a bunch of pickup sticks, walking through that would be a nightmare. But what this does, this does a number of things in our forest. Um, we call it deadwood, aptly named, but it really, it can hold water. So uh, deadwood actually holds onto water way longer um, than any, you know, any uh, other part of our ecosystem. So it can really help in those droughts. That, uh, this jumble can protect regeneration in here. So um, this is a really nice little sugar maple um, growing here, but there's also little, uh, I think that's an oak in there. There's a bunch of little regeneration. It protects those um, seedlings from deer herbivory, which is a, a big problem in our state. Um, it can help cycle nutrients. So those stems and branches actually contain quite a lot of not only carbon, but calcium and magnesium and all sorts of different things. So it's a natural process that these would be broken down um, by fungi and microbes and bacteria. So it gives home to those. Habitat for wildlife, you can see uh, you know, a grouse or some other animal using this as a hiding spot, birds, um, and can really be helpful in preventing runoff too. So this is a big thing. We don't have enough dead wood in our forests. Traditionally, the thought was that this looks messy and we should clean this up, um, right? You can't really walk under it, walk through it, but this is natural. If you look at old growth forests, there's a lot of dead wood, there's things all over the place and it's messy. And that stuff does a lot of ecosystem service um, and it can really help stop the runoff of water um, and, and, and prevent erosion too. So on that, that protects, helps protect soils. Um, and just to remind you again, I, have, I haven't honed it in enough, is this value of soils and carbon storage, right? I think we think a lot about plants growing in trees, but, but soils are incredibly important and protecting them um, is, is paramount in how we think about, when we think about forests. Um, and then we also need to manage for other stressors. I wish that climate change was the only stress that, that forests um, experience, but unfortunately there's quite a lot of other ones. I've touched on insects. This is 
emerald ash borer you may have heard in the news. We have it here in Vermont. It is an invasive pest um, of ash trees and it's almost, it's over 99% lethal, which means it kills most ash trees. We're still figuring that out. It's, it's kind of developing, but it's been in the Midwest for about 10 years. Um, and we have things like tree diseases, is beech bark disease um, that affects beech trees. We have non-native earthworms here. So, um, you know, growing up as a kid, I never thought about it, but earthworms aren't supposed to be here, at least the ones we have. Um, they were brought over by Europeans. Um, and while we like earthworms in our garden because they cycle nutrients in the forest, they cycle nutrients too fast. Um, so they really chew up that litter layer um, and they create this it's sped up nitri uh, nutrient cycle um, that means that a lot of those nutrients can get washed away in a rainstorm or overland flow, things like that. So earthworms are pretty bad. They exist really deep in our forests too, um, not all forests, but, but they've been here for a while. Um, invasive plants, as you can see this really, what we call monoculture, means it's one species dominating of buckthorn, I mean a, a barberry, excuse me, um, but invasive plants, they um, can take advantage of climate change a little bit better than our native plants. Um, and they can create these conditions where, you know, how would a little seedling uh, germinate? How would a seed germinate in there? How would a seedling grow? There's just not enough space. There's no light. It's too much competition. So invasive plants can really cause um, problems that way. Herbivory deer, they really love tree seedlings um, and they've been causing some problems. We have really big population of deer. Um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife has recognized this and they've actually cre uh, increased um, hunting uh, license uh, tags this year and increased some of the um, regulations on herbivory, including uh, taking antlerless deer, so non-male non uh, deer, which is recognizing that deer can really, you know, they're a natural part of our system, but too many of them without their big predators, like wolves that we've removed, um, they could cause a lot of problems to our forest and we really need to preserve that future forest. Um, we've had acid rain issues here. It's getting better, um, but it's still an issue. As I mentioned, land use history. Here's a photo of what you know, it used to look like here, which is kind of incredible. We also have an issue of forest fragmentation. So this is basically breaking up of forest blocks into these smaller parcels. Um, and while they still will provide some benefits like carbon sequestration and uh, oxygen release, they, it makes it hard for um, seed to travel, for a, a tree to move north if it needs to, if it can't, if there's a physical barrier. Obviously affects wildlife and other um, parts of the forest as well, so that's a big problem. Um, and as I mentioned, we're experiencing forest loss in addition to climate change. So all the, these these stressors can interact in complex ways that we really don't totally know about, but really it's about, if we're thinking about climate change, we also need to think about if there's these other stressors present and how we can ameliorate them. Um, and so the last one is the use of ecological silviculture where it's appropriate, right? So we might have refugia for old uh, forests or for unique forests that we do not touch. Um, and I think that's incredibly um, important to have, but there's also places where we can use ecological silviculture to help the forest progress in its development. And at the same time, we can actually harvest wood products. So we can get um, saw logs to um, make products. We can get firewood for our heat and not have to use fossil fuels. So there's a lot of really important benefits um, to using silviculture in a really ecological and thoughtful way. So a couple ways um, that we, a couple like really basic things that we can do with ecological silviculture. So like overarching um, uh, techniques that we can use and they touch on a number of things that I've mentioned. So we learn from forests and we mimic the natural processes. So as these forests are all similarly aged, they need these disturbance events to kind of create these gaps in the canopy so that the new seedlings would have space. They need to have tree mortality so that there's dead wood on the ground. So those kind of things, if you think about how long a tree lives, which 
you know, sugar maple can live for 300, 400 years old. It can take a while for those processes to happen in a forest. So we can kind of speed it along um, by using silviculture, right? Not appropriate everywhere, but it is appropriate in a lot of our forests. It creates working forests and it can create these great wood products. Um, so a phrase we use is structural complexity. We want to increase that. That means the dead wood on the ground, the standing dead trees. We also want to have different sizes of trees. We want seedlings and saplings and small trees and large, huge, large trees. Um, we want snags, which are standing dead trees that can be used for habitat like you know, uh, woodpecker habitat and, and uh, uh, porcupines and raccoons. So, you know, it, it, it fills a lot of niches to increase the structural complexity. The, also the benefit is that usually most, most part increases the carbon storage and sequestration of the forest too. So they can have multiple co-benefits um, to doing these things. Um, and then, as I said, we wanna increase the species diversity. So that's just making sure we don't have any one species that's overly dominant in case you get some stressor that comes to that forest. So you get a pest that you, most of our pests, our um, insects and diseases affect one species or maybe um, a one genus. So that's like ash trees. We have three different species of ash and emerald ash borer affects all of them, um, but it doesn't affect other trees that aren't ash. So if you had a 100% ash stand, that'd be very vulnerable to emerald ash borer and a good management practice would be okay we need to increase the other species representation in this forest so that if emerald ash borer does come it has less catastrophic of an impact right it won't wipe out every single tree there's also some evidence if we have um, more species diversity um, there's a lot more healthy ecosystem functioning it actually might prevent a really big outbreak of a pest anyways. So, so there is some, some, some reasons to do this. For example, in a lot of sugar bushes now in maple syrup uh, forests where they're tapping, really promoting other species actually makes the sugar maple you're tapping healthier and can prevent other uh, pests uh, and pathogens coming in affecting the sugar maple. So species diversity, structural diversity, paramount to we think about our forests. Um, so this is an example of, of, you know, some forest management we can do. And this is a creation of a, what we call a patch cut. Um, and, but what we, but what's happened here is it's, we've retained uh, trees in this patch cut. You can see there's trees, so this is great habitat perch sites for wildlife. Um, you can see there's a lot of messiness here. It's not clean. You know, there's a lot of branches, this tree, these trees have fallen down, which is great. I love to see that. It's great to have um, mortality happen naturally over time because as those trees fall and die, they'll, you know, add more dead wood um, to the system. And so this is an example of, of a, uh, adding this complexity to a landscape, right? So it doesn't all have to happen in one spot. Over here in what we call the matrix forest, left alone or maybe some small harvesting and then a patch is patch cut is here benefits songbirds this forage for animals um, and it allows for this regeneration so we won't have all these trees over here 80 to 100 years old suddenly we have a new cohort of trees um, that will be coming up and often new species so there's lots of different things we can do in the woods um, in our forest to think about this um, and, and, and create these conditions by mimicking these natural processes. All right, I guess I'm on my last slide, which is take home messages. Only have three, so hopefully you can uh, remember these. First, hopefully this is the one you've got, trees are amazing. Um, please go outside when you have a chance and look at a tree, a street tree, a forest tree, whatever, and appreciate all the, all the things that it has provided and, and all that it withstands. Um, and also the, the importance of soil. I think, you know, we haven't really given soil uh, enough credit for all that it does, um, but we really need to protect our soils. Um, and they, they do amazing things in carbon storage being one really important thing that offsets some of our greenhouse gases here in Vermont, um, but certainly around the world. Um, and that forests, not only they, can they help us mitigate climate change if they're kept healthy and productive, 
by taking in uh, carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, um, but they're also vulnerable to its impacts. And so this really, um, it, it really means that we need to be thinking um, as a state on how to um, protect and steward our forests into the future um, under climate change and gives more reason for us to um, really reduce our emissions as a state, as a world, so that we can then protect forests. So that's kind of this give and take um, that we have with forests. Um, they provide us with amazing things and I want those things to still be provided by forests. All right. So there's my email. Um, this will be questions, but uh, you know, if you have something comes up um, and you have a question, um, please email me, uh, Alexandra Kasiba. I also go by Ali, so you can refer me refer by me by either name um, if you want to ask me any questions about what's like working for the state, anything like that. I'm happy. I'm happy to talk to you. So great. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I know I learned a lot, and I know there are lots of great questions. Um, in the chat that Clemencia will ask. And um, I'm sure Clemencia, if you need some clarification from a student, she may need to shout out to you. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull through. the chat so, up. Okay, I got the chat, yep. Okay, and great. Ali, it's up to you. You, If you can easily view it, um, you're more than welcome to just go down and talk. Um, or would you prefer me to read them to you? Um. I, I'm happy to read them out loud. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, okay, uh, Nicholas asks, it's not a stupid question, never stupid questions. As certainly, um, yeah, not, but do different types of trees emit different amounts of oxygen? So yeah, I didn't really, you know, it was one of the, the parts of, you know, how trees are amazing. Yes, they, as they take in carbon dioxide photosynthesis, they're actually emitting that oxygen part of the CO2. Um, they'd only emit different, amounts based on their productivity. So photosynthesis um, is, you know, the whole process is based on a tree's age, the species, where it's growing, um, the conditions, the weather. Um, so those would also impact the oxygen production. So it's really, uh, it's based on the rate of uh, photosynthesis. So that would be the, the real reason. So a healthy productive tree, um, there wouldn't be any differences, but, but it, Yes, certainly throughout the season. Um, if you have conditions where a tree is not photosynthesizing um, as much, um, it will not release oxygen. And it actually will need oxygen to do metabolic processes. The respiration actually uses oxygen and releases CO2. Um, so that's one thing. As we have stressed out trees um, and they don't photosynthesize as much and they're actually respiring because they need energy, you can actually have a condition where they're releasing more carbon dioxide. Hopefully that clarified things. Um, what do you mean by carbon market? Okay, yeah, that's, I breezed through that, but basically there are these, um, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but there's basically these uh, systems now in place, and you may have heard California has the most robust one. So um, it's called the regulatory carbon market. It's basically, a, by market, just means like an online platform for selling and buying these carbon emissions. Um, and so California has created this cap and trade program. It means they said, okay, you know, businesses, industry, you have to limit the emissions that you are releasing. And so they could then, they have to limit their emissions, but there's certain amount that might be really hard. Like if you think about transportation costs and you're switching from uh, fossil fuel using trucks to electric vehicles, there might be a time when you have to emit some. So you can purchase um, an offset from um, somebody that is producing extra carbon. So forests do that. There's all sorts of different ways you can sequester carbon. Um, but those are just traded on this carbon market. And there's now other markets that have come up after this, this California one. Um, but that's just a general, general term of, that's used for a place for buying and selling carbon offsets. Um, what exactly is Vermont's use value appraisal program? So this is, um, yeah, so it's basically if you have 25 acres or more of forest and you have to have an active management plan. So it has to be that you're managing for something. You can manage for songbirds, you can manage for recreation, you can manage for timber, you can also manage for multiple things. 
you have to have a management plan written by Forrester. Um, and then you get a reduced tax rate on that land. So instead of that land being taxed at the rate of every other, all other land, like where you're, where someone's house is or where a business is, it actually gets taxed at, and it's for agricultural land too. So it's forest land, agricultural land, and you get a reduced tax rate. And so it incentivizes people having forest management plans written by a forester, which is very important. You don't have to have that to harvest your forest, but it's very good. Um, and it also means you get penalized if you then did something outside that management plan or you um, converted it to development. Um, so it really is, it, the idea was to help keep working forest forest and the idea that to keep forest forest, we, we need to help forest owners pay for it or at least incentivize that they keep it forest. Um, do different types of trees use up, store, recycle more carbon than others? Is there a type of tree that is especially significant to the health of Vermont's forest? So yes, different trees um, do sequester and store um, different amounts of carbon. Again, it's kind of tied to my answer for the oxygen. It does depend on like the tree size, where it's growing, the weather conditions, but also the species. So um, uh, a vigorously growing tree, so there's certain trees like um, uh, the quaking aspen that we have here or eastern cottonwood that grow really, really, really fast. They don't live very long, they grow fast. Those trees are taking in a lot of carbon versus like a slower growing tree like sugar maple, um, or uh, American beech, They're, those trees live really long, so they tend to grow slower. So yes, the amount of carbon, but a storage really depends on the size of the tree and the density of the wood. So actually a tree like sugar maple can be really big, they have super hard dense wood, they store a lot more carbon. Um, and then a smaller tree stores less than a bigger tree, and it's actually exponential. It's not you know, a 10 inch sugar maple and a 20 inch sugar maple, that 20 inch sugar maple store is like, I don't know, it's like five or seven times more carbon than the smaller tree because it's not, um, yeah, it's an exponential increase in that size. It's volume of wood. Um, is there a type of tree that's especially significant to the health of Vermont's forest? I guess I'd say sugar maple. It's probably iconic. We love it. Provides a lot. Beauty. Great wood. Um, really excellent for for, for folks that work with wood. Um, and so certainly if we see a decline in that, I think, I think that will, people will be very alarmed. Um, and it's, you know, perhaps more sensitive, as I mentioned, it has like shallow roots and likes cold, likes really cold um, conditions. Are we destroying the world's forests and climate by using wood? Um, no, we are not. I mean, I, I, I guess I won't speak to the world because there are uh, unsustainable forest practices happening throughout the world. And I think actually that, that I think we have a moral obligation to get our wood and our heat from Vermont because we can control um, the social conditions of people working in those forests. Um, we cannot control those conditions from you know, the Amazon, things like that. Here we have workers' comp, we have a um, really good system for protecting uh, foresters. Um, and so wood and forest, uh, wood and, uh, excuse me, wood and uh, wood heat um, can be sustainably harvest um, from forests. And often we, you know, we have places in the forest where it's actually, we kind of need to go in and do some management to get it into a healthier state because of that land use history. We have forests around the state that were planted, like we have plantations um, of monocultures and those are really unhealthy. A lot of them are dying. Um, so going in there and actually harvesting the wood. And like I said before, in that whole carbon uh, uh, cycle, really using wood for wood products can lock that carbon in. And at the same time, as you've harvested, that forest is allowed to regrow. So you have new saplings, new seedlings coming in. Um, so really you can increase the actual carbon um, content of that acre because you've put some into wood products. Um, and I think in using wood offsets fossil fuels. I think fossil fuels are something we really need to get away from. Um, and so using wood grows back. Um, you can buy it locally. Um, you can get it within our state. We produce a lot of it. And a lot of it, uh, wood is an important, uh, wood heat um, and wood low grade wood products we call them. So like 
uh, cord wood for, for um, wood stoves or pellets. It's actually a really important part of sustainable forest management um, is, is, is removing some of those degraded trees. We leave some of them, but sometimes we have forests around here that have been really um, degraded over time and they, they kind of need a little bit of management. Um, what preventative measures can we take to further protect Lake Champlain from harmful runoff? Um, well, I think the agricultural issue is, is a big part of that. Um, from forests, what we're doing now is, as folks realize that um, increased rain, rainfall is an issue, is making bigger culverts, making better drainages, designing our roads to not be straight up and down a slope, which you may see um, historically was the case. So a lot of it is just getting that water to not run off, having places that we can allow that water to absorb, keeping forests. Forests are great. Um, one of the best systems we have, um, aside from wetlands, um, for keep slowing down forests, slowing down water. Um, so keeping wetlands as they are, restoring wetlands if that's appropriate. Um, so, you know, there's, there's many ways we could uh, think about this. And of course, there's the agricultural component and, and the impervious surface component, right? So think about Burlington really perched up above Lake Champlain, all those hard surfaces that can have, you know, fossil, you know, little bits of car fuels leaking on them and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that, that we could do in combination. Um, could root exposure cause damage to, to the soil and things around them? Um, I'm not, I, well, it could, the thing that it would cause damage to is that it would, so those, the roots are, you know, they, they create, they can create air pockets in the soil. You still need air in the soil. It's kind of hard to imagine that, but there are little microbes and things that still need oxygen. Um, so if you had um, soil more, uh, if you had root mortality, it would, it could change that, it could collapse the soil, right? So you could have um, those air pockets be lost. Um, but in the short term, it actually released probably some nutrients to little microbes, but it certainly would change that community in there. So there are fungi and bacteria that are really um, dependent on, on uh, tree roots. They provide tree roots with things and they also get, get um, sugars from tree roots. So, so I think it would just, it really would change the, um, the community and, and maybe even the, the structure of the soil. So I think in a, in a broad scale, sure, um, but it's probably one of them, probably not a huge um, outcome. Oh, in the picture of you and the tree in the beginning, what are you doing? Great question. Um, so that is a, it was called an increment borer. And it's basically like a little, like a little auger um, that you put into a tree. And um, then you have this little piece of metal. It, so you, you screw it into the tree all the way. You're trying to get to the center of the tree. And you have this little um, piece of metal that has teeth on it and you pull it out. Um, I'm trying to look if I have one to show you. Um, and I don't know if that will show up, but this in here, I don't know if that, you can see that, oh, kind of. So this is what you pull out. So those are, this is a tree core. It's in a, a wooden mount, but basically you take out this tree core. This is taken from a live tree and because it's so small, the tree heals it up. Totally fine. I mean, you wouldn't want to do it every year, but it's totally fine. We've monitored these trees. They heal them up. Um, and what is amazing about this is you can not only get the age of the tree, right? One ring gets put down every year. But you can actually compare it to climate and environmental variables. So that's some of my past research is what I did is looked at how trees um, we have here in Vermont are responding to um, climate change and the environment. And you can actually compare climate records to the size of the tree rings, which is pretty uh, super, super cool. Um, all right. How deep do roots tend to go? If trees have shallow roots, how does it stay grounded during a strong wind storm? Yes. So trees have multiple layers of roots. So they might have really deep roots to hold them in there, but a lot of what we call their feeder roots, which is how they get nutrients. So yes, a tree makes its own energy, but it still needs things from the soil like 
um, same that we need, like calcium and magnesium and iron, and uh, it needs all those uh, nutrients from the soil. And so it has these feeder roots as well as water. Um, and those often aren't as deep as we think they are. So a tree's roots actually spread a lot more than they go down. I think we, we often think we were maybe taught that you know, the roots would be a mirror image of the tree at the top, but it's really a lot more spreading. Um, and, uh, and they do topple over. If you, it's really cool if you are in the woods and you find a place where there isn't a lot of soil, so maybe there's bedrock and just a small amount of soil. The tree, trees can grow there, but they often get toppled in windstorms. And it's really cool if you find one of these because you can look at the roots that have tipped up. So the tree falls and it leaves the roots in the air and you can look at them and they're often very well spread out um, and they'll find little cracks in the roots in the rocks to get water and nutrients. Um, and it really depends again on the species, like a, an oak has very deep roots um, compared to some other species. So really depends. Um, are certain tree species more affected, af affected by shallow roots being killed by freezing? Yes. Um, so it kind of depends on where they have those roots. Like I said, sugar maple just tends to have um, these kind of shallower feeder roots. It, sugar maple really grows in really, really rich, nutrient uh, rich areas in our state. And so um, they have a lot of organic material on the surface. So it's really uh, evolved to have these shallower roots, whereas other species um, um, will, don't have as much of a problem um, with that. So yes. For example, in that study that I showed where we actually removed, we shoveled, shoveled the snow off in the winter, um, we did see that the sugar maple was more affected than some other species like red maple, which is a little bit more, it, it, it's very populous here, but it's, it goes a lot more south um, and it can grow in warmer areas and it did, was not as affected. Um, do dry springs affect the trees during that time? Yes, um, it's really important for trees to have water in the spring because um, if you think about um, a deciduous tree like a sugar maple or an oak that loses its leaves in the fall, it needs to then, and it made its buds back in the growing season, it keeps those buds all winter and then those buds need to expand and uh, needs to grow those leaves. And so that process involves lots of water. So yes, probably dry spring is the most problematic time to have a drought. In the summer, trees can deal with it a lot more. Certainly in the fall, they're usually fine dealing with the drought. Um, if we have less moisture from snow melt, would it, eat, would it be equaled out by increases in heavy precipitation in the spring? Maybe, except we're not seeing those increases in precipitation happen uniformly through the year. Um, where we're actually seeing really big increases in precipitation, yes, we are seeing some in the spring, so you're right, those may offset. Um, we're seeing a lot of increase in precipitation in the fall. We're having a lot more wet falls, um, which has been problematic um, for like diseases, you can think about like diseases really, tree diseases like to have wet conditions. Um, so yeah, there, there could certainly be a balance of those things, um, but we can't really predict them that's so um, volatile. A year that has low snow melt is warm doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be a spring that has lots of water. Um, is less precipitation snow in the winter because is mostly continuation of rain or less precip precipitation all over in the winter? Yes. So often it's, um, that's a good cl clarifying question. It's not necessarily that we have mo less moisture in the winter, it's that it's warmer. And so that precipitation that would have normally fallen as snow is falling as rain. Um, or what we get, this has been happening a lot more, we have snow and then we get rain on top of that, which can lead to a lot of flooding. Um, are evergreen trees as affected by warmer winters? Um, yes, some evergreen trees are very affected by warmer winters. Some of our evergreen trees grow up in our coldest parts of our um, state, so like balsam fir. And the thing about evergreen trees, a lot of them, because they have their needles, they actually more easily can come out of dormancy. So if we get a really warm winter, right, a deciduous tree like a sugar maple doesn't have leaves. so. It's only so much it can do, um, but actually a, a, a evergreen tree can come out of um, 
uh, dormancy and can try to photosynthesize and things and then actually can get really damaged. Its needles can get damaged um, if we get a cold snap again. So, you know, it's really species dependent. Um, I don't know if it as a group evergreen, I, maybe evergreen trees would be more affected overall, but it's, it's a little bit species dependent and habitat dependent, right? Because we have some species like white pine that is really warm loving species and it's, it will probably do okay. So do trees go through some sort of natural selection depending on the environment? Yes, they do, but the process takes a while. Um, so we have, uh, you know, genetic differences in the population. If you looked at all the sugar maple around the state, different populations, different what we call local adaptation, right? So the sugar maple growing, uh, you know, up where you are in the Northeast Kingdom are going to be very different than the sugar maple growing in Bennington County, right? Because they've just adapted to those conditions. Um, do hemlock woolly adelgid benefit any other areas that have too many hemlock? Uh, are hemlocks a healthy tree for environment? Yes, hemlocks are incredibly important. They uh, are really a fundamental tree in some uh, in lowland areas. They exist along uh, stream beds and riparian areas. And because they're evergreen, they keep the water really cold because they don't lose their needles. So they keep kind of moderate temperature. There's a lot of benefits to hemlock and they're re one of our oldest, um, longest lived trees here in Vermont. Um, bears use them as nurse trees. There's, there's so many different uh, important functions of hemlock. Um, and so I wouldn't say there's ever too many hemlocks. In fact, they've been there. We probably have too few hemlocks because they were really uh, harvested pretty heavily in the early 19 uh, hundreds. Um, they were used for tanning leather. Tanneries come from hemlock bark. So they actually were over harvested. So we have fewer hemlock than we would have had before uh, European settlement. Um, I'm keeping mindful of the time too, so. Yeah, we want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, we love hearing your answers. Um, but you know, I'm still scrolling, I think the numbers <laughs> keep going up. There's a lot of questions to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, would it be okay if the students reach out to you by email? With the, yeah, with certainly. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. I totally welcome that, yep. Okay, great. So there's lots of interest. Thank you. You can see all, all the questions. Yeah, coming. no, I love it. Yeah, it's great. Great. Thank you. We'll continue to reach out with us with questions. Thank you again for this awesome presentation. We loved having you. Um, and if you find some new stuff, we'd love to have you back <laughs> at Current yeah, Topics. Definitely. We do this every year. So I think we- I know, it's, it'd you. be great to be in person because we could actually, I could demonstrate some of this stuff. So maybe yeah. next year. <laughs> yeah, we'll, Certainly. we'll keep you on the list. <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, yeah, please reach out if you would like. All right, we'll see everyone next week. Thank you.